Good morning, DEF CON. Can you hear me? Yeah? Well, thanks for coming this morning, Sunday morning at 10. Um, it's not too many of you, but hopefully those, are the, those of you that are here um, are very interested, are either very interested in OpenVMS or just had nothing better to do. Right, so the goal, first of all, I want to let you know that we know absolutely nothing about OpenVMS, but we do know how to break it. The goal of this talk is um, to prove to you that even though an operating system that has been con considered very, very secure and reliable for 30 years can be broken and actually can be broken quite easily. The, some of the bugs that we found were very trivial to, to find, um, a little more, a little harder to exploit, um, but were quite easy to find. Anyone here an open VMS user? Good. Anyone from a HP? No? Right, the OpenVMS user can take a, a short nap. The talk um, is broken on, into three parts. There will have a lightweight introduction to OpenVMS. Well, we'll just cover the, some of the history, some of the fundamentals of the operating system, history of bugs, etc. Then we'll have uh, Krista and my colleague Klaus um, talk about the VAX and Alpha architecture, and in particular, in particular how they managed to exploit that. and how they managed to write shellcode for it, the um, challenges that they faced and how they managed to overcome those challenges. And most importantly, the last part will show you the root prompt. So let's go right ahead. OpenVMS was developed in the late 70s by digital and it has some of the standard features that nowadays are considered um, well standard for an, op for an operating system, but then they were quite innovative. So all of the standards such as multi-user, multi-processing, virtual memory, real-time processing, transaction processing, those were pretty cool at the time. Um, as far as the ownership goes, Digital developed it and owned it up until 98 when Compact took over, and then HP uh, owns it today. Initially, it was called VAX VMS. Um, VAX was the hardware that ran on, and it was developed at the same time with the operating system, probably the first time that that happened. Um, then the VAX name dropped, and it was just called VMS, and then later Open VMS in the 90s when um, the open standards gained more, more and more popularity. VMS is not similar to Unix in any way. Um, however, it, is, it does share some similarities with Windows NT. Because um, one of the developers, Dave Cutler, who initially developed VMS, was then called at Microsoft to develop Windows NT. It runs of, on three hard, hardware architectures. Uh, VAX, which is a 32-bit system, CISC, and also Alpha and Itanium. Um, Chris and, and uh, CMN will talk more about the VAX and Alpha later on. It is considered secure and reliable, even more so than OSX. So why would we want to hack OpenVMS? Well, first of all, nobody hacks it, and it's considered very secure, unbreakable. It runs on, it runs critical operations in, in financial systems, uh, lots of banks, and the majority of stock exchanges have some OpenVMS systems running. It runs your SCADA infrastructure systems, uh, your railway, uh, your electricity boards, they're all controlled by open VMS systems. In the UK, the NHS system use it a lot for their back-end system. Another, um, <coughs> and in other areas you can find it, such as manufacturing, Intel uses it, and education and the military also use it. It is also certified by the Department of Defense for its security. Um, it's challenging and it's a lot of fun. If you want to try out OpenVMS, you can um, get a, 
get an account online with the guys at Death Row, uh, which we've used, and it's pretty cool because they give you access to a cluster of both alpha and VAC systems. And they also encourage security research, so you can play around with it. And they, they also have a, a small deck net, so you can play around with deck net as well. There's also this crazy guy in Germany, which is great. He, he runs a, a VAX cluster in his basement, and he'll give you access for free. If you're particularly interested in uh, testing out the Itanium features, then uh, HP will give you um, a limited access to Itanium. So as far as getting the software goes, the best way to do that is to go through the hobbyist program, uh, which is a cheap way of, of getting a, a, a license. And for, at least in the UK, for 30 bucks and a local subscription of $100 a year, you can get um, a valid OpenVMS license. We use emulators. Um, there's a free version of Personal Alpha available. It has limited functionality, such as you can only uh, use 128 megabytes of RAM, uh, one Ethernet card, and four hard disks. Uh, but it's absolutely fine. It runs fine on my laptop. It is Windows only, so if you're looking at running it on any other platforms, it uh, won't work. There's also Sharon, which emulates VAC system. There's a demo version available. And uh, Sim, which is, uh, again, emulates VAX. It's free, and it runs on most operating systems. If you do go out and buy your own hardware, be aware that uh, the size can be pretty big, so do check with the wife. The user environment, well, it does run an X server with CD, so Unix users will be familiar with that. Um, although it is pretty hard to get it running on an emulator, and it really isn't worth it. Um, the DCL, which is the default shell of VMS, is what you'll uh, be interacting with. Um, it is case insensitive, so if you're a Unix user, that's different. And it, you can't run commands explicitly. You have to uh, either uh, use run um, or define a foreign command before you can run a binary. In, um, back in 88, 89, um, um, a couple of worms propagated through DECnet. Um, they were relatively simple. They just exploited weak passwords on um, Finger and FTP. Uh, but they did cause a lot of havoc, uh, bringing down thousands of VMS systems in a short period of time. Uh, as far as vulnerabilities reported in OpenVMS, there aren't that many. And um, most reported vulnerabilities are pretty old. And you can't find much information on them. The, pretty much the only source where you'll find that is uh, textfiles.com. Quick vul vulnerability graph. Um, these are very rough figures, but they kind of show that OpenVMS is way below, um, way below the average. Uh, we're looking at increasing that a little bit. So, VMS survived DEF CON 9. A um, bunch of guys set up these alpha clusters uh, running VMS in, uh, back in 2001. And apart from someone compromising the uh, Telnet password of the system admin logging in, uh, no one managed to break into those systems. So the VMS users were really proud of that. Um, it, one of the great things that, of VMS, or, which can bite back, though, is uh, it's very fine grain controlled, um, so you don't need uh, the system user for for everything. When is the last time that you saw a VMS exploit? Well, if you want to get an account on VMS to run our exploits that we'll show later on, uh, you can try the usual stuff. Uh, try some default accounts, some weak passwords. Uh, the system user never locks out. Um, it, the passwords are also uh, capital by default. Uh, you, can, you can change that, but it, it is a pain. So the chances are that um, you'll have uh, no case. There's a, the default password hash algorithm is pretty weak as well, so you could try to crack that. 
and some default accounts that you can try a system field uh, operator default backup um, etc some important files that you want to be looking at are the VMS images dot that it's a binary file and it lists all the VMS images or programs um, and their respective privileges. So if you want to start breaking uh, some of the software, you want, you want to look at this file, uh, look through it and grep through the uh, images that run with uh, certain, certain high privileges. We have the rights list dot that, which again is a binary file and is not readable uh, by default by a normal user. And it contains all the, uh, the user list and their, their rights. Um, the system user authorization file, which is like the password file in Unix, uh, it contains the users and the hashed passwords. This is a binary file, but if the administrator um, has converted that to a text file, it will have created a dot list file in the same directory, and by default that will be readable by everyone, so check out that file. When you log into a VMS system, it executes the login.com script, uh, so check, check that out for malicious lines of code, um, or if you, can, if you have right, right access, then you can run some commands in there, put some evil, evil commands. The WAST is a, an open, open source web server for VMS. It was specifically written for VMS, and it's um, the default choice for running a web server. It's pretty fast and reliable. But unfortunately, the initial release was really full of security holes, which allowed you to compromise the system fully. Um, loads of bugs, such as full directory traversal, completely bypass the ACLs on the system. and by default, it had some sample CGI scripts which could be compromised to, again, gain access to the system. There are still old versions out there I have found. Um, so if you come across a VMS system on the internet running a web server, do check uh, out that they're running WASD. Uh, maybe it's outdated. If you, if you run across um, a website running on a VMS system, uh, do check out the dash character uh, for directory traversal. Usual stuff for enumerating users on the network through SMTP, Verify, EXPN, Finger, all those work. Again, you can try default accounts, um, or you can try um, some easy to guess accounts such as Postmaster, Default, etc. Again, you can do that through the files that I've mentioned before, the rights list dot dat, sysuaf dot dat. The way that OpenVMS protects the files uh, using three main means main main way, ways um, one of them is through the UIC which is a user identification code that's made up of the group ID and the user pair uh, it isn't necessarily unique uh, although it is preferably unique and group ID 1 to 10 by default belong to system users although you can change that there are many privileges on OpenVMS, um, and again, you can use those to uh, control access to files in a more uh, fine manner. You can also add specific ACL files, and those will take priority um, over any other uh, protection. As I said, there are really loads of privileges on OpenVMS. Um, Users, VMS users will tell you that for this reason, VMS is much more secure. Um, but unfortunately, although the default uh, usually are very restrictive, there are many of these privileges that directly enable you to get system privileges. So it is very similar to then having root directly. There's high usage of logical names in VMS systems. These are like aliases uh, to shorten up the really long uh, paths that they have. Uh, they have a record management service which um, lists all the files in a database form. 
It's also pretty cool that they uh, have fa file versioning by default, so each new file that you create um, has an appendix, uh, one, two, three, etc., and uh, can go up to thousands. Uh, this is just an example of what uh, VMS path, path uh, looks like. Files are owned by a user group. We have four permissions. We have read, write, execute, and delete. And these are applied to four groups, system, owner, group, and world. Again, we have privileges such as bypass, which will allow you to bypass all privileges, read all. Again, you can read everything. Uh, system privileges and group privileges, um, which again gives you complete access. We have ACLs as well for fine-grained control, uh, which I mentioned earlier, and every file can have uh, an optional ACL, and that takes priority over everything else. Chris is now, now going to talk about uh, his research and uh, his bugs that he found. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of bugs I found in the finger client. And I find it a bit interesting that 20 years after the big internet forum exploited finger, uh, a supposedly secure operating system like OpenVMS is still absolutely trivial to own with the finger uh, binary. So finger, when you finger a user, it will try to open two files uh, for that user, the .plan file and the .plan uh, project file. The problem is on OpenVMS, the finger client runs with pri uh, high privileges and it follows links. So what you can do is you can link your .plan file to a file you want to read and then finger yourself and finger will try to open that file for you and display the content of that file. Um, I don't have a demo for it because it's such an easy bug. Uh, the next bug is a bit more interesting because it can actually give you a root prompt. So at first I thought about trying to find a buffer overflowing finger, but I figured that they probably fixed all of them. So I checked for some format string vulnerabilities instead and found that I could trigger format string vulnerabilities uh, through the use of the .plan file and the .project file and also through the command line. I choose to uh, use the dot plan file in my exploit. Um, this is a screenshot of finger misbehaving a bit. What I'm doing first is I'm using the installed program to list the privileges of the finger image. And as you can see, I hope it runs with system privilege and world privilege. What I'm doing next is I'm opening my um, .plan file, and you can see a couple of format string characters in there. And then I finger my user, and when finger tries to process my .plan file, it triggers the format string vulnerability. So to exploit this vulnerability, you're going to need a uh, shell code. And to write a shell code, you need to know a little bit about that uh, platform. VAC stands for Virtual Address Extension. It's a 32-bit platform. It has an executable stack, at least in OpenVMS. I don't know about other operating systems. Uh, it has four privilege modes, and OpenVMS uses all of them. It's a CISC uh, platform, has instructions for absolutely everything. And the platform has been discontinued, but you can still get a lot of uh, information online, so it's not a problem finding documentation. Um, this slide isn't very very useful for use land exploitation, but at least according to the documentation, uh, the top two gigs of virtual memory is uh, reserved for the kernel. Below that you have P1 space with DCL stacks, symbol tables, etc. And finally you have a P0 space where your program is loaded in for execution. The first problem I ran into trying to develop a shellcode is that 
I'm a Unix user, and I found the Open VMS environment to be very, very hard to work in. And I didn't like the tools at all, especially the debugger. So to speed up development, I installed NetBSD uh, in my emulator and used GCC and GDB instead. Uh, my first idea for a shellcode was to use a libc-based shellcode. And the calling standard is pretty simple. So what you do is you push all the arguments onto the stack in reverse order and then use the call s instruction to call a function address with the number of parameters you uh, want to pass to the function. The call instruction does a few things. It saves registers if the called function requires it. It saves the flag register and the return address on the stack. Uh, return, val return values are passed back in a register as well. So it's very, very simple and it works, but sometimes you don't have access to a good lib libc function to call. And if that happens, you have to use system services. System services are a bit like uh, system calls in Unix. So this is a simple libc based shellcode example. I think what it does is, um, yeah, it just calls systems and execute a program for me. <clears throat> then I developed a, a shellcode um, that uses system services. And again, to call a system service, you push all the arguments onto the stack in reverse order. Then you call a function that executes uh, a chmk, chme, or chms instruction with an operand. This operand is just a number that lets OpenVMS know which system service you want to call. A major drawback with this approach is that system services usually takes a lot of arguments, and uh, they also take the arguments in the form of descriptors. So instead of passing a string, you pass a string descriptor to the um, system call. And this is what a descriptor looks like, basically. The top one is a string descriptor. And since you uh, have to write position independent code, you have to update all these fields at runtime, and that leads to the shell code growing even larger. There are a few things you can do to make exploitation a bit easier. Like, for example, you can exploit symbols. Symbols are executable, and this is really important on uh, alpha in particular because they have a non-executable stack. There are also string descriptors, and as such, they can contain uh, pretty much any characters, including null bytes. And that makes writing the payload much, much e easier. Um, we haven't actually found a really good way of finding the right service number. So the way we do it is we write a small program that calls one service. And then we set a breakpoint uh, on the CHMK, CHMS, and CHME uh, instructions run it in the debugger until the breakpoint hits, and then we just look at uh, the operand for that instruction and get the number that way. This doesn't work on uh, the alpha platform, unfortunately, because they don't support this particular feature in their debugger. Uh, so on alpha, you pretty much have to single step through the entire program. Um, interesting system services to call from your payload are <coughs> system services that create processes, modify user records, or grant privileges to a process. And this are just a few examples. You can find a lot more um, if you read the documentation provided by, the, by HP. So here's a bit of an interesting note. When I was getting familiar with VAX, I tried to exploit a really, really s simple stack overflow. And I knew I hit return address with the address of my payload, but the program just kept crashing without even trying to execute my payload. And I discovered that it was because <clears throat> the flag register, with, which is saved below the return address on the stack, contains a, uh, a byte that is defined uh, as MB set. It has to be zero, otherwise the program will crash when it tries to return. So I thought, well, I knew that uh, Morris exploited a bug in the finger uh, 
finger deep surface in his internet worm. But it turns out that he didn't have to use any magic tricks or anything like that because his bug was th uh, triggered through a call to gets, so he didn't have to worry about null bytes. So my conclusion to this is that there are probably a lot of really, really stupid bugs on this platform that are really, really hard, if not impossible to exploit, but then again, you don't have to worry too much about it because you still have a lot of special cases like uh, gets, for example, or pointers on the stack that can overwrite and entire other bug classes like form string vulnerabilities. So just to summarize before I show you my demo, my, my bug is a very, very simple form string vulnerability. I use the .plan file uh, to hold my form str format string and my shell code. I use a system service to modify my user record. And this particular service will send a log message so, you know, it's not very stealthy. And my username is hard coded into exploit. So, if you have a different username, the, the exploit is not going to work for you. But that's not my problem. Um, so, let me show you the exploit. Okay, so I'm logging in as my user on my box. No, it doesn't work. Oh, it's Okay, what we'll do is we'll carry on with CMN's talk and then at the end we'll try and get these videos working. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, alpha architecture, which we also take, took, uh, took a look at. As we all know, it's a 64 bit architecture, RISC, and uh, you can find a lot of uh, information about the instruction using MSDN. It's very good organized, so it's really neat. You have to um, keep in mind to flush the instruction cache when writing shell code for this architecture, um, especially when writing self-modifying code, of course. As we mentioned earlier, you can use personal alpha, which is a free emulator, if you want to play around with it. We did not manage to boot BSD, uh, and we never tried Linux. But you can also build the GNU binutils with, with, with alpha target. And, create a shell code on your local PC. However, as Christer mentioned, it does not work with the function pointers the way it does in, in Unix because it's not a simple address that you jump to. You have to uh, construct a function descriptor instead. And um, to fully understand that, you really need to take a look at the OpenVMS calling standard. Uh, the vulnerability that I, that I found uh, resists in the command line interface library. Um, it's used by a lot of applications, so it's widespread and got a lot of targets. It fails to handle crafted command lines, and uh, this vulnerability has ver been verified on OpenVMS Alpha 8.3 in the default install, and basically it gives you total control of the program counter. To trigger this vulnerability, you simply find a um, target program that uses the command line interface, and while you're at the prompt, you paste or type 511 characters, 
and then the up arrow key three times, and then you manually type the return address. Just wait for it. Here's a screen dump of a crash in the TCP IP program. And here is a similar crash in the stall program. Uh, as you can see, uh, the return address is a bunch of Bs. And at the, at the end of the screen dump, we uh, get an error message say, saying that we don't have enough privileges to dump core for this process, which is quite interesting since that um, implies that we have a set of privileges that is interesting. As I said, we have multiple targets with this vulnerability. For instance, we have the, the install program, which has the privileges to run kernel code. We have the TCP IP program, which has the privileges to, to perform physical I.O. And we have the, the Telnet client, which gives you the operator privileges. You can use that for roll sockets and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, uh, n now that we, we have control of the program counter, we obviously need some shell code. So uh, the, C the C calling standard is complex, as we mentioned before. So you actually need uh, to know pretty much about it. And there is a, a, a document that covers everything. The stack is not executable, but uh, as Christian mentioned, we could execute code in logicals. So that's useful for local exploitation. When it comes to remote, we have to do other tricks, perhaps copy the code to an executable location or similar things. And uh, yeah, flushing the inst instruction cache is important uh, for self-modifying code. Um, my exploit doesn't need really need to get uh, to know the location of the shell code, but that's uh, sometimes the case. So you you obviously need to get PC code running uh, in, in some. <coughs> in some cases, the PC register can't be directly read. So it's a bit of a, 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 a fiddle to, to get this running. But the shellcoders handbook has a really nice solution, which um, stores the IMB instruction with the opcode of 86 and then overwrites the, the branch instruction in the second loop and saves the PC register in the, in the 16th register before the shellcode continues to execute. To do something really useful, you need to be able to call system services or um, uh, as system calls in Unix. You pass the six first arguments in the A registers, and then you push uh, additional arguments onto the stack. You also keep an argument counter in the 25th re register and the system service index in, in the zero register. Uh, keep in mind that uh, the index vary from um, uh, OpenBSD versions. So you really have to make sure that you have the right index for the target that you are exploiting. And the instructions used to jump into kernel mode and run uh, execute the system service con contains null bytes, which ev even the IMB instruction does. So it's a bit tricky to get stuff uh, null free. The create process system call is inter interesting for exploitation since it allows us to execute an arbitrary uh, binary on, on the file system. And uh, when this binary is executed, we inherit the current privileges of the process. This particular code doesn't do a clean exit, so it will actually crash when the, when the program has been executed. So where do we in, in, inject the shell code? Um, we could use the, the, the command line in the overflow, but that suffers from a lot of heavy input restrictions, uh, control codes and stuff like that in the command line interface. I also use Telnet for, for, uh, to automate this exploitation, and, and you get some um, input restrictions there as well, but you can easily overcome them with the terminal settings. What I did was that I populated a, a target process with data in certain areas and then crashed it and scanned the core dump basically to see where the data was located. You can use the analyze program to uh, take a look at core dumps, to eval registers, dump certain area of memories and 
assembly instructions. You can also use download program to get, get a, a nice list of, of the different memory segments in the process. This gives you hints about where you, where you could, could search for, for the data you have injected. I first found my string or my shell code in the command line interface data segment, but I couldn't execute it there. I got an access violation. So I decided to fiddle a little with the input restrictions and try to make a shell code that copies the, the, the shell code to another location and remove the, some input filtering in the terminal, uh, talent client. Uh, I ended up with a shell code that almost all, only uses the LDA instructions since that got an OP code that was accepted by the input filtering. However, did, this didn't work since I got, I didn't even have permissions to read at that, um, at the, in the command line interface uh, data segment. So it didn't really help me much, but it, it's a nice code to use in, in uh, other exploits. So uh, we can actually use to, and execute code in logicals with nulls even. So you just have to upload your shell code into a logical and then jump there to execute it. When uh, analyzing, um, the, when finding the address of the shell code, you can use the analyze program as well. And they use the clue process logical command to, to get the direct address of, of, of the shell code. But you need system for this. So, so if you don't have that possibilities to, to, to increase those, those permissions when researching, you could simply just scan the core dump as well. Yeah, so what I did was that I, uh, I, I wrote a proof of concept uh, exploit that that calls the creative process system service. I first upload the, the shell code using uh, a tool that simply just adds it to logical and spawns a sub process. And then I wrote a little program called uh, file.exe, which simply just um, uh, prints the, the, the privileges of the current process. So it's a neat way to see what kind of privileges you gain from the target. Unfortunately, uh, we got some problems with the video, so... Uh, yeah? Do you have... Uh, Thank you. Okay, so this is my proof of concept code uh, exploit. We start by at attacking the install program. So we connect to the to the target machine, and I first delete the, the privilege file that is generated by the file.exe program, and then just run it and take a look at what kind of privilege, privileges we have, and it's only the default. Then we load the shell code into the logical, spawns the sub process for us. Then we run the install program and trigger the vulnerability. Now the install program will crash when the shell code is executed since we don't handle, doesn't handle the exit after that. 
So now we just have to take a peek into the privs.txt file to see what privileges the program has when it was ex executed. And as you can see, we got kernel privileges now, so we can actually run kernel code. And this exploit also works for for uh, a lot of other targets, as, as I mentioned. In this case, we are attacking the TCP IP program the same way. So. Still have the default set of privileges for this user. Load the shell code, spawn a sub process, and then the TCP IP program. Trigger the vulnerability, and the program will crash. And we peek into the privilege file to see that we gained actually physical I.O. privileges. Yeah. I can show you the last one as well. It's for the Telnet program. Uh, so we run the exploit again with Telnet as target, just as we did before. and the program will crash. Okay. And now we got open privileges as well. Okay, I think that Christer is going to show his video of his exploit as well. I'm logging on to my box with my normal user. And I try to set all privileges for my process and it's not working. And I look at what uh, privileges I do have and I just have the default ones. <coughs> So I compile the exploit. And I link the exploit. And run it. So at this point, the exploit has run. And I've modified my user record. So next time I'm logging in, I'm going to have full privileges. Um, so let's try that. So I'm enabling all privileges, and then I show all privileges, and you can see I've got a lot more privileges now. Actually, I got all of them. So I think that's it. Any questions? Yeah? It seems like this is a, a privilege escalation attack. Did you, did you find any vulnerabilities you can take advantage of without having an actual account in the first place? 
Uh, these are all local. local, yes. Thank you.